Greetings to all. If I were there with you, this is what I'd look like, roughly. Podium, stage, and lighting depending. But enough about me. Meet Jane. No, Jane is not her real name, nor is she in very good shape, but she is, after all, 400 years old. She probably looked like this in her lifetime, just before she died, in the struggling English colony at Jamestown, Virginia, in the terrible winter of 1609 to 1610, known as the Starving Time. Jane may indeed have succumbed from lack of food, and then she became food. The archaeologists who excavated her remains in 2013 immediately noted that she had been cannibalized after death. The cannibals, meaning Jane's fellow colonists, had dug her up to feed themselves. They hacked open her skull to get her brain, sliced off parts of her face, and then reburied her. So much for early American food being a quaint ye olde topic. Many scholars had dismissed eyewitness accounts of survival cannibalism at Jamestown as propaganda directed against the Virginia Company of London. But Jane's remains corroborate the colonial rumors. Her scarred skull is an excellent reminder of the materiality of colonial America's past. Indeed, the presence or absence of food in the colonies and then later in the United States has been a critical reality at all points in our history. And yet it has taken a surprisingly long period of time for the history of food to acquire an important place within the profession of academic historians. There are three reasons for this. First, historians have been concerned, if not panicked, to avoid the label of material determinism. Culture, ideas, conscious actions, and every other kind of deliberative human motivation and action have instead been conceived as the main drivers of history. Within my own original field of early American history, Events were supposed to have ideological origins, not material ones. That preference conditioned how historians decided what topics to look at and how, and food was rarely in the picture. Second, many studies of American food have actually been examinations of culinary history, the high end of the field, the analysis of cuisines, restaurants, and luxury consumption. This struck many scholars as epiphenomenal, if not frivolous. It's a widespread joke among food historians that the only subfield that seemed to be more frivolous than food history was the history of fashion. Oh, but it's only a coincidence that both subfields, food and fashion, have had strong intersections with the fields of women's history and gender studies. Third, there was an equally strong prejudice that America was the land of plenty, that food history cannot really be very illuminating because food was never a significant problem in American history. What, then, could it possibly reveal? Well, right now, all three of these old ideas are dissolving faster than a cookie dunked in milk, and it's about time. Historians are finally ready to admit that America had material as well as ideological origins. There is at last acceptance that food history is more than culinary history, though also a new defense of cuisine is far from frivolous, itself a powerful analytic tool for culture, class, and gender. Finally, it's no longer tenable to believe that America has always been a land of plenty. Even when things were better than at Jamestown during the starving time, many people went hungry in the past. And even when there were conditions of plenty, it's always worth asking, plenty for whom? Let me wrap up with some indications of how and where I pursue this new line of inquiry that food is one of our best indicators of America's material origins. I do this in my own research. This past fall, I publish an essay, Food and the Material Origins of Early America, in a volume of essays that I co-edited with two colleagues. Uh, the volume is called Food in Time and Place, the American Historical Association Companion to Food History. And I have examined the scarcity-related history of food in a book I am co-authoring, The New Worlds of Thomas Robert Malthus, in which Alison Bashford and I argue that the new worlds of the Americas, Australia, and Pacific Islands were central evidence for, and indeed constitutive of, Malthus's notorious theory that humans could reproduce faster than food could be produced for them. I'm also a member of the Harvard Initiative on the Science of the Human Past, led by my colleague Michael McCormick, which unites questions and techniques from the sciences and humanities in order to re-examine the human record and this project very much includes the history of food. I'm delighted that among my many wonderful graduate students, several are pursuing topics in food history. These are their names and topics, and I will pause now to let you read through them, getting a full sense, really, of what food history is and can do in the work of the rising generation.
I am also advising two new journals in food history. These are Global Food History, of which I'm a founding board member, and the Graduate Journal of Food Studies, for which I'm a faculty advisor. Finally, I teach food history to undergraduates. I do this in Harvard's general education program in the category of United States and the world, and the course is called American Food, a Global History. This is a big subject that I have defined according to ideas of scarcity and abundance. But next year's iteration, come spring, will also emphasize the question of how did the past taste? To get to the bottom of that, students in the class will enjoy or maybe endure food samples as well as non-food samples, meaning the experience of hunger. Here's a possible menu for you to savor. I'm just kidding about the human flesh. We won't really be eating that. Pretty much everything else, though. Feel free to drop by. <laughs>